Man, turn those exhaust fans on full blast, will you? Boris said irritably, watching Valmo fiddling with the power loader's control panel. Those containers aren't going anywhere. The stench is so thick I can barely breathe. Valmo pulled himself away from the gutted console with the bunch of wires and petals of crystal circuits sticking out and looked around the cargo hangar of the station. Some of the black and yellow containers were already neatly arranged on racks, but the bulk of the cargo was still piled in the center of the deck. The squat hexagonal containers looked like stumps of some weird technological trees, but each weighed about 200 kilos, and moving them without a power loader was next to impossible. What's wrong with the smell? Valma took a deep breath. I think it's kinda nice. Definitely not disgusting. The smell was indeed pleasant. A mixed aroma of flowers, freshly worked wood, a little bit of mushrooms, and, of course, honey. A normal station shouldn't smell like this, Boris grumbled. It's like a small shop where grannies go to buy some flower seeds. As long as it bring us a good buck, I don't care what the merchandise smells like, even if it stink like a hundred pigsties. That argument worked. If it weren't for a merch from Earth, they would have had to sell the station long ago and look for jobs on a big trading hub or settle down on one of the farm orbitals. In fact, they had already been planning to do just that, when a honey eater representative had come to the station a year ago. Valmo grinned. It had been Boris who had insisted that they should not send the Earth representatives to hell, but rather check out about what the honey eaters had to offer. It turned out it was quite an offer. The access to the outer colonies was forbidden to Earth ships. There weren't many active stations in the transshipment zone, such as Valmos and Boris, and even fewer people agreed to deal with the honey eaters, even though everybody wanted honey from Earth. All right, Boris said. You got me there. A couple more years, and we can settle down somewhere where real flowers bloom and normal bees fly. They say they've even managed to project blue skies onto the outer shields at Olympus. Stop kidding yourself, Boris. You know as well as I do that in two years we'll only make enough for a week's tour on the outer settlements of Olympus. But we'll probably have enough for a couple of small organic farms somewhere on Ganymede. You can paint blue skies on the inside of the dome, if you wish. Valmo sighed. Believe me, I'd like to breathe real air and bask in real sunshine, as much as you do. So what's the matter? Boris asked grimly. The earth is welcoming all. They have even cancelled visas. Get on the nearest honey ship and go. The great hive will be glad to have another convert. Valmo only waved and went back to the disassembled console. This languid argument had long ago become the linchpin upon which their entire life at the transfer station was strung, ever since the honey eaters had arrived with their first shipment. They'd have to figure out the cargo hangar's central console before the first customers would come unless they want to take part in a stupid powerlifting contest. Half a century has already passed since mankind realized that the Earth was lost to it and that it would not be possible to destroy the Great Hive. Even the most radical opponents of the B superintelligence were not ready to get rid of it at the cost of carpet nuclear bombardment of humanity's cradle. Moreover, at least a billion people have remained on Earth, living in a weird symbiosis with the Great Hive. The rest called them the Honey Eaters, 
and despised and hated them. Access to the territory of the outer colonies was closed for honey eaters, but this damn but turned out to be so big and delicious that it was simply impossible to refuse. Honey. The biological civilization of the Great Hive actually produced only one expert position. At least, it was the only thing the hive traded with the outer colonies through its representatives, the honey eaters. The earth needed technology, energy carriers, and the rare earth metals. Humanity needed quality food, antibiotics, antivirals, and stimulants. And for those who were willing to risk of doing hard time, other substances that could be used to alter consciousness and temporarily forget about the dull life in orbital ghettos or on chlorella plantations somewhere on Saturn satellites. Supplies of honey from Earth could provide all of that. The bees, who had crossed the threshold of intelligence quite unexpectedly for humans, first drove technological civilization off the home planet. Then, as if nothing had happened, they began establishing trade ties with the outer colonies. No one was ready to fight a real war, and the Great Hive allowed anyone who didn't want to become a honey eater to leave the planet unhindered. Several decades had passed since then, and by now, dreams of reconquista of Earth remained popular only with the most radical of people. Others had adapted to the new life, making the best of the situation. Most preferred to pretend that everything was going as planned and that there was nothing unexpected and surprising in the fact that the solar system was divided between two fundamentally different civilizations. Of course, it was all to the Great Hive's advantage. Valmo finally put the console's front panel in place plugged in all the connectors and power cable and pressed the start button. The control display on the console lit up. It showed different colors of racks and containers, which had to be arranged in a certain order according to the marking chips. The goods delivered by the last freighter of honey eaters would soon be taken by several wholesalers, who would take care of the retail packing and delivering of the goods to the end customers. Valmo typed a few commands into the terminal. The loading unit, which looked like an angular mechanical spider suspended from the sailing beams, shuddered and leisurely extended its paws toward one of the containers. After arranging everything on the racks according to the delivery notes and orders, all that will be left to do is to run a quick check and go to bed. Boris had gone to his room another half an hour ago, when he'd got tired of grumbling. Valmo had long ago learned to ignore him, but today his partner's words had struck a nerve. What were they really doing there? The irony was that neither Valmo nor Boris really knew what was in the containers. Honey it was, but what kind of honey? Wholesalers placed orders by contacting the Great Hive directly, the station was only needed for transshipment. It was a requirement of the Outer Colonies Customs Service, which received copies of all way bills. Occasionally, inspectors flew to the station to check and count the goods, but what initially seemed like a risky new adventure had become a boring routine over the time, including for the customs officers. Their visits become more and more infrequent. Anyway, all wholesalers were checked once more upon arrival at the worlds and stations of the outer colonies, and that was without exception and with a thorough inspection of the cargo. All this time, for Valmo and Boris, the goods remained what they looked like from the outside. Standard hexagonal containers that differed from each other only by identification numbers. The Great Hive didn't bother with any other labeling. At the beginning of the venture, 
Valmo, for some time, was checking on all the identification numbers and trying to figure out some system, but then he gave it up, having accomplished nothing. Gradually, lulled by the measured motion of the power loader and the flickering display, Valmo started to doze away. He was brought out of this hypnotic trance by a sharp buzzer. The sorting was finished. He steered and opened his eyes. Strange. The program displayed a green label indicating that the sorting had been successfully completed and all the containers had been racked according to the way bills. However, there were still, Valmo did a quick count, eight containers lying on the hangar deck. He grunted and rose tiredly from his chair. Apparently, in addition to the failed hardware, there was also some kind of software glitch in the loading and storage processor. Valmo glanced at his watch. Damn, the time had passed well past midnight. Okay, the first client would not arrive until the day after tomorrow. So there was still a whole day to deal with the error. And now it was time for a good, nice sleep. In the morning, he found Boris had gotten up much earlier and had already had breakfast alone. When Valmo arrived at the cargo hangar, the deck gleamed with worn metal in all its very glory. The eight containers that had remained unaccounted for yesterday had been removed. Morning, Valmo said, approaching Boris, who was putting a grate back on one of the ventilation shafts. Morning yourself. Boris said without turning around. His tone was only slightly friendlier than usual. I have already checked those fans. He nodded at the dark opening of the exhaust shaft. Can't get rid of the damn smell. Valmo sniffed the air. Man, you're getting a little obsessive. I can barely smell anything. Boris grunted as he pushed the massive grate into the hole and began screwing in the mounting bolts. Am I? He shrugged. Well, maybe. It was time to check the motors and loop them anyway. Valmont decided not to get into an argument. Thanks for figuring out the warehouse program, he said. I fell asleep on the go last night, so I thought I'd save it for tonight. What was going on with those containers? Boris turned around. What containers? he asked, looking Valmo straight in the eye. Valmo was confused. Well, the ones the program missed yesterday, he said. It signaled that the sorting was finished, but eight of them were still standing here, he pointed to the deck. Good thing you figured it out. Did you find out the glitch? Oh, those containers, Boris said. Valmo thought he had uncertainty in his friend's voice. It was nothing. I rebooted the system a couple of times, and everything went as it should. You know, I don't know much about that software stuff. All right, Valmo said. I'll run some testing later. We have to find out what it was. You say the power loader spread it all out? Loader? Oh, yes, it did. Boris looked thoughtfully at the far end of the hangar. You know... I think I'm gonna check the whole ventilation system. It's time to service it anyway. Jeez, that damn wind system really stuck in you. Valmo laughed. A buzzer went off in his pocket. Shit. He pulled out a small device. Narrow beam call. Code it. He scratched his head. Looks like customs again. I'll go get it. Yeah. Yeah, go for it, Boris said absentmindedly as he approached the next grid. If anything, you know where to find me. The customs inspector arrived at the station three hours later. It's been some time, Lucas, Valmo greeted him, extending his hand. The inspector had docked his ship in the auxiliary airlock on the opposite side of the station, so as not to interfere with any of the clients if they happen to arrive ahead of schedule. What brings you here? Miss us? 
Lucas Farhazi, Chief Inspector of the Outer Colonies Customs Service, shook Valmus' hand. Wish I would never see your tin can of a station again, he said with a chuckle. I don't know how you don't go crazy out here. Hanging out here, in the middle of nowhere, in the no man's land between Earth and the colonies, seeing nothing but each other's faces for months. Valmo sighed. Lucas, stop reading my mind. Do you think I'm here for the love of solitude or to keep company for Boris? I'm sick of it myself, but I have to make a living somehow. To tell you the truth, he winked at Lucas, we plan to call it off in a year or two. We're both already looking where to settle down. And instead of you, I will end up with yet another two stupid hustlers looking for a quick rip-off. Lucas shook his head. I bet they won't be as law-abiding and methodical as you are. Valmo stared at the customs officer. Lucas looked unusually tired and anxious. Trouble? Tons of them. Lucas waved his hand hopelessly. There's been a flood of black honey on all the major stations and satellites. It's gotten to the point where some places have had to declare a state of emergency. And something strange is going on with Gideon. A week ago, they stopped communicating and won't let anyone in. Technically, the Gideon cluster is considered an independent colony. So the government hasn't decided to invade yet. But damn it, almost three million people are living in the cluster. How can it be that they all instantly stop communicating? Even if they're all hooked on black honey, it's still weird. Black honey, that is, all sorts of honey that had narcotic effects, was illegal to import into the outer colonies. The problem was that the Great Hive didn't give a damn about people's laws. If someone was willing to buy such goods, Earth was willing to supply them. And if paid properly, they could synthesize a new option with unique characteristics. It all came down to delivery. The automatic defense system destroyed any Earth ships as soon as they entered the colony's territory. So Hive had to work through transshipment stations. Lucas, you know we don't do that kind of thing. Even small time stuff, even including legal positions. We don't need it. Why take the risk? Besides, you know Boris hates the honey eaters to his guts. He used to be a member of the radical party. One of those who called for sterilization of Earth. Lucas patted Valmo on the shoulder. Don't worry, I believe you. It's just that we're under new instructions. Total inspections of all stations after every unloading. Some of the wholesalers are slipping hot stuff past the defense bots and past the customs. God knows how they do it. He yawned. I'm sleeping four hours a night, speeding all over the system. So let me shoot a quickie at your place and move on. Let me at least make you some coffee, Valmo said. We still have a real one from the plantations of New Eden. Lucas cheered up. That would be awesome. I've had my head screeching from stimulants already. Good old natural caffeine. What could be better? By the way, where's Boris? He's up in the vents somewhere. He says he's sick of the smell of honey and honey eaters. Lucas shook his head. I wish I had his problems. And it doesn't even smell that bad. Well, let's not waste time. He picked up his briefcase and headed for the control panel. Black, no sugar. When Walmo returned from the galley with a mug of hot coffee, the inspector had already connected his terminal to the warehouse system and scrutinized the invoices accumulated since his last visit two months ago. He didn't really need to. The custom software would have found the slightest discrepancy, but Lucas believed that human mind could find inaccuracies or odd coincidences even where the program thought everything was correctly filed. Thank you, Lucas said, taking the mug. I want to pay you a compliment. 
all the paperwork is in order, and all the records are clear and bright. It's just exemplary. You can't even imagine how crazy it goes at some of the stations. And I don't even mean smuggling or anything like that. It's just a total bloody mess. Some of them haven't even got proper software yet. They're typing everything in manually. Can you imagine? Well, to be honest, we have glitches too, Valmo said. Just yesterday, the remote control and the program glitched at the same time. I worked late into the night, and Boris only figured out the glitch this morning. It was giving out some nonsense, as if we had eight extra containers not listed in the system. It happens, Lucas said absent-mindedly, looking at the screen. Nothing in our world is fail-safe or guaranteed, except the heat death of the universe and taxes. He sipped his coffee happily, then squinted and stopped scanning. It looks like this glitch has been sitting in your system for a long time, he said. I just noticed it. It's not in the main register, but a deep scan shows evidence of eight additional containers registered in each of the last 12 deliveries. For a very short time, literally for a fraction of a second, as if the system malfunctioned and then caught up and deleted it. He took another sip of coffee. Damn, I miss that sometimes. Anyway, if I were you guys, I'd hire a good software tech to give your old steamer a proper service. Think of it as an unofficial official customs order. It's no good having a virtual item living a life of its own in the system. Valmo scratched the back of his head. I wish it were virtual, he said. Yesterday, I had eight real containers left after sorting. That would be one hefty glitch. And I don't know... He suddenly stopped talking, having realized the meaning of what he had just said. The customs officer's gaze instantly became sharp and cold. I want you to tell me all the details from this point, he said in a completely different tone. Start with where those containers were placed by the system. Valmo spread his hands. I don't know. Boris put them away this morning. He suddenly remembered his partner's strange behavior regarding extra containers and felt cold creeping up his spine. Get him in here, and he'd better have a reasonable explanation for what happened. It's not that I don't trust you, but after what happened on the... Shit! Ouch! The customs officer slapped himself desperately on the back of his neck, just above the collar of the uniform jacket. His face contorted with a momentary grimace of pain, replaced by bewilderment as he brought his hand up to his eyes and saw what lay in the palm. It was a large bee. What the... Lucas started to say, but didn't finish and fell to the floor. I'm sorry about that, Boris said, gently taking the bee out of Lucas' limp fingers. But I couldn't let things fall apart at the last moment. You! Boris nodded tiredly. Yes, me. I'm sorry, Valmo, but I couldn't tell you. I was planning to wire you half the money anonymously later. I don't want to spend the rest of my life sniffing around the stinking labyrinth of Ganymede or some crappy station in the asteroid belt. I want to go to Olympus, and that costs money. A lot of money. Valmo looked at his partner in horror. But you hate the hive! You hate honey eaters! I do, Boris shrugged. So what? I can't destroy them, so why not use them for my own good? And ruin a lot of people's lives at the same time! You mean those miserable cowards and suckers who, for sentimental reasons, didn't dare to burn out the breeding ground? Boris asked. As far as I'm concerned, to hell with them. Maybe those who survive will realize that they should act differently, get wise at last. But I don't care, really. I'm old, I'm tired. 
and I want to spend the rest of my life in peace and prosperity. Valmo began to back away slowly. So the black honey in the markets is your doing? Well, not only mine, Boris answered. Do you think that all the transshippers and customs officers are as patriotic and incorruptible as you and their friend? He nodded at motionless Lucas. Is he dead? Boris smiled. No. Why kill him? Killing is a purely human passion. The hive tries to maximize all resources. After a deep reformatting, our friend will make an excellent honey eater. He smiled even wider. Just like you will. I'm sorry, Valmo. It's nothing personal. But I can't let this last deal go spoiled. Gideon's cluster is expecting new forces from Earth. He stepped to the side, and Valmo saw black and yellow clouds of bees pouring out of the ventilation shafts throughout the hangar with a buzzing sound. The hive has decided to expand its area of influence, Boris said, almost invisible because of the bees swarming around him. And I have decided to make a little money out of it. A stubborn old radical. Almost terrorist. Who would suspect such a person? That's why Hive came to me. Valmo barely made it. The communication between bees and ordinary humans were probably not as stable as with honey eaters. So the swarm did not immediately realize that it was necessary to attack Valmo too. After all, the bees had secretly coexisted with him on the station for several weeks and had gotten used to him to some extent. Valmo slid into the central control room, sealed both entrances, and looked around carefully. There were no bees in the room. There was only one vent here, a circular half-meter-wide hole in the ceiling, blocked by a plastic grid. Valmo quickly broke out the grid and plugged the hole with anything he could find. Soft headrests from the chairs his own shirt, some old papers. After finishing that, he lowered his gaze and shuddered. Boris was looking at him through the transparent window, surrounded by a dense swarm of bees. What are you going to do now? Boris's voice coming from the speaker sound muffled, interrupted by a bassy hum. You won't be able to open the airlock and throw us into the vacuum. I've taken care of that. Besides, part of the colony is located in the ventilation hub, and that will be cut off if the airlock is open. You can't depressurize the whole station anyway. You can't get to me, Valmo said into the microphone while rapidly typing command after command on the console. I don't have to, Boris said. You can't sit in this doghouse forever. The customs officers are logging their roots, Valmo said. Lucas will soon be missed, and they'll realize that he disappeared at our station. That's right. I didn't think of that. But it won't happen right away. A couple days to realize he's missing. And a few days to get here. I can get the shipment to Gideon in time. And deal with you, of course. They won't let you anywhere near the outer colonies after that. You can forget Olympus forever. Boris's silhouette, barely visible behind the dense mass of bees, shrugged. We'll see. I prefer to solve problems as they come. Right now, my main problem is you. However, it is almost solved. Valmo heard some rustling and crackling coming from behind him. He looked back and was horrified to see his makeshift plug slowly beginning to fall out of the vent. He rushed to the terminal again. Typing the last command, he hit the enter button. At the same time, the pile of junk finally fell to the floor under the weight of a vast mass of bees, and the mighty humming filled the room. The great hive was satisfied. Of course, this time the attempted at advance had only partially succeeded. 
before the outer colonies fleet destroyed its own small hive, only 20% of the reformatted units had been transferred from there. In addition, a very valuable independent agent and his station were lost. But the hive had gained confirmation of important information. First of all, it is possible to get agents without reformatting. The most surprising thing was that this last agent worked with Hive even though he did not hide his hostility. This called for more research in the future. Secondly, the station incident demonstrated that humans were capable of self-sacrifice for their swarm to a far greater depth than Hive had hitherto realized. Blowing up the station's reactor, along with themselves, for the good of the others. Perhaps this could be a new impetus and serve as a fundamentally new consensus for the greater fusion. The research had to continue.